Okay, well, thank you very much, Ruth. And um, you're right, it's a bit of a mouthful, the title Gender, Sexual and Relationship Diversity in Bereavement and Grief. The other option was just to call it Queer Grief, which I guess is what I have been calling it privately, uh, but that seemed maybe slightly less appropriate. Uh, so the correct term is Gender, Sexual and Relationship Diversity. So we're talking about people who experience um, gender diversity, sexual diversity and relationship diversity. Um, we're going to talk about bereavement, we're going to talk about grief. I wasn't really sure how to structure the presentation because this is more just things to think about. Your counselors, um, you work in end-of-life care, you work as funeral celebrants. It's just little prompts to be like, oh yeah, I didn't know that this was a thing, or mm, I hadn't considered that, or oh yeah, this actually happened to me, or it happened to someone I know. So I was I didn't know how to make it into, you know, like bullet points, like this is queer grief. This is how gay people grieve. This is how, you know, polyamorous people grieve because that's not at all what I, um, I absolutely cannot, cannot do that in bullet points. So what I've done is I've just put together uh, little fake quotes, uh, little stories of, um, they're taken from, uh, from myself, from friends, from clients, and they're all kind of mixed together so they're completely anonymous and confidential, but they're supposed to just help you connect to some of the personal experiences that um, queer people um, have around bereavement and grief. So take care of yourselves today. If you are queer yourself, if you have experienced grief, if, even if you are not queer, if you have queer loved ones, um, we're going to talk about some upsetting topics. We are going to talk about suicide. We are going to talk about hate crime. So just a little warning here, try to take care of yourselves, try to stay in your body, use touch if you need to bring yourself a little bit of comfort. You can touch your cheeks, you can touch the back of your neck. I'm sure a lot of you already know how to do that, you know, deep breaths. And if you need to take a step away, you know, get out of the presentation for a wee second or two, that's absolutely fine. If you have questions or anything that you want, if you have comments, if you have an important personal experience that you want to share, I would absolutely love to hear it. Um, you can put it in the chat, you can share it with Bruce and then share it with everyone at the end of the presentation. We've got a, a good 20 minutes for that purpose. Does that feel okay? Ah, oh, everyone's on mute. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, Pam, thank you. Um, okay, so let's go ahead. I just thought we'd start with a little bit of um, terminology. LGBT, lettuce, guacamole, bacon and tomato. <laughs> Thank you, MNS. Um, LGBT stands for lesbian, bisexual, gay and trans. Um, we now say LGBT, oh sorry, I spelled that wrong. Uh, LGBT and now we say also Q for queer, I for intersex, A sometimes for ally and then plus because there's actually lots of identities um, and so for instance relationship diversity is not represented in the acronym LGBTQIA, hence the plus. GSRD, gender, sexual and relationship diversity. Non-binary, that's a gender identity, it's not a sexual identity, it's for people who don't identify as either female or male. Gender queer, likewise, for people who are who um, exist on the spectrum of gender without necessarily choosing one side. Gender non-conforming, also a gender identity um, of people who are neither male nor female or who skip from one to the other or who exist in the in-between. Pansexual, just in case anyone hasn't heard that one before, it's also, a, so that's a sexual identity, not a gender identity. And it's for people who are attracted to male, female, non-binary, gender queer, gender non-conforming people. Queer is a very catch-all term. Uh, I'm very aware that in the English language, it has up until very recently been an insult. It still is, I think, in some circles, I guess. Um, I'm not a native English speaker, so I identify as queer, but I'm aware that that's not a word that has ever been thrown at me with the purpose of hurting me, so maybe that's easier for me to use that identity. But a lot of people choose to identify as queer nowadays, um, and that covers basically anyone who doesn't fit into heteronormativity. Um, so people with diverse gender identities, diverse sexual identities, and diverse relationship models. Polyamory. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Somebody's just joined and then on mute. I'll sort. I'll, uh, okay. okay. Welcome. 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 Yeah. 
Um, polyamory is a relationship model where people have more than one partner. Ethical non-monogamy is also a relationship model where people tend to have maybe one primary partner um, and then they can date or have sexual relationships with other people. Relationship anarchy, also a relationship model where uh, we believe that all relationships are equally important, be them family or friends or romantic relationships or sexual relationships. There's no hierarchy. Um, I feel like I've forgotten some stuff in there. Oh yeah, uh, transsexual people who have a different gender identity to the identity they were assigned at birth, or with cis people, people like me, I was assigned female at birth and I still identify as female, so I'm cis female. If there's any questions around this, please stick it in the chat. Um, so one thing we wanted to make sure for today is that I know there's a lot of vocabulary and it can be difficult to get everything right. If you have questions, if there's something that's really confusing, if you're like, but why do we use the term cis? Or uh, why is bisexual okay if, compared to pansexual? You can definitely ask all questions are absolutely welcome. I just ask you to do that from a place of genuine curiosity. Um, if you have if you have issues with people identifying as queer, again, it's okay to talk about it, but I ask you to do that from a place of authentic care and curiosity. All curiosity is welcome. Not knowing stuff is absolutely fine and you can ask and we can talk about it, um, but please try not to be disingenuous. If, if I feel that someone is just trying to push uh, a homophobic agenda or a transphobic agenda, then I will ask you to leave. Yeah, oh, that's thank okay. you. Yeah, no, thank you, Clem. Thanks, Ruth. Okay, so um, marginalization. I'm gonna I'm gonna say queer people a lot, and I hope that's not too offensive for people who don't identify as queer. People in the LGBTQIA plus community experience marginalization through life. So in the workplace, um, street harassment, definitely medical medical marginalization, but also in end of life and death. So the most recent survey I could find was from 2014. I know it's 10 years ago and things definitely changed fast. But so the data we have is that one in four people from the LGBT community expect to face barriers when planning a funeral. One in four also worried about being treated poorly by a funeral director. Two in five feared discrimination from religious leaders and one in five feared discrimination from family. So this is not actual experiences that people have had. This is people fearing that this might happen based on their experience of life so far, which leads them to believe that this is likely to happen um, around death or bereavement. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. I will also say that this is mostly based on my clients, my friends, myself. And so um, it's mostly white people. It's mostly people from like Christian backgrounds. I don't have any uh, queer Muslim clients, so they are completely underrepresented in this presentation. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that I don't care uh, about the experiences of gay Muslims. Um, it's just, I'm just gonna talk about what I know. Um, and you can feel free to use that as a springboard to think about some of your, some of your clients or your friends who may be gay and Muslim. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna start with religion. At my grandfather's funeral, as soon as we went into the church and the priest started talking, I felt my grandmother and my mom relax and lean into it. For me, I shut down completely. I know this space is not for me and those rituals are not for me. I know I don't belong in this particular tradition. I just sat through it for my mom's sake. I didn't feel like this was the place where I could say goodbye. Um, a lot of gay people have been discriminated against by relig uh, in, in religious spaces and by religious leaders. Um, up until really quite recently, um, being gay was uh, a sin in a lot of places still to this day. Um, churches don't accept gay people. In a lot of places, churches don't accept trans people or people with um, complex or different gender identities. Polyamory is absolutely not recognized or welcomed in the church. So for a lot of people who are not, you know, following heteronormativity, religion is not a safe space. Now, when it comes to grief, when it comes to bereavement, a lot of our rituals are rooted in religion 
or in cultural traditions which are at their heart or at least historically homophobic and transphobic so it could be very difficult for a queer person to embrace the religious aspects of a funeral obviously i know nowadays you don't have to have a religious funeral if you don't want to and so i don't know if you lose your uh, gay wife, you don't have to give her a super religious funeral if that doesn't feel authentic to you or her. However, if you're going to the funeral of your grandpa, your grandma, or if you have to organize the funeral of your very religious mom, then you have to go into those traditions. And that can be quite triggering. That can be quite painful. Um, belonging. So as I'm sure some of you will know, needing to belong is a normal human need. Uh, we are social animals and so we need to feel like we belong to a community. Uh, sometimes that can be difficult for queer people. I left my wee Highland village in my late teens and I'm living my best queer life in Glasgow now. Everyone in my family knows I'm gay and it's all fine, but I can definitely express myself here in ways that I couldn't back home. Going home for my grandmother's funeral was a bit tough. It was emotional because of course I'm sad she's gone and I'll miss her but there was this added layer of almost trying to not be myself too much. It made me irritable and overly sensitive. And I wish I could have opted out of that just and just thought about my gran. Um, so this is a mix of testimonies I've heard from clients. And um, obviously it's not exclusively queer people who feel that uh, feeling like you can't quite be yourself when you go back home, you know, is relatively common. Um, but it's particularly true for gay people yeah. and, yeah. Yeah. sorry. Uh, okay, it's okay, Clem, no, it's just, I'm just gonna carry yeah, please do. Um, yeah, so for queer people, and I think particularly for trans people, um, a lot of non-binary people are not out to their family because you can identify as non-binary, but you can pass as male or female and so a lot of NB people just don't come out because it's just easier um, and so going home for a funeral it means that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to grieve to feel your grief and to share your grief with your loved ones it's also a time when you have to mask you have to pretend to be what you think people want you to be um, and it can be very subtle it's not like it's not like anyone said, oh, my mom told me not to be too queer at my grandma's funeral. But the subtle as it is, the pressure can feel extremely powerful. Um, shame. We were going to have to talk about that, right? An old friend of mine died of an overdose. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years, but I went back for the funeral. He was the most flaming gay guy you've ever seen. But his whole family just pretended like he wasn't. I was there with a few other friends from that time and we're just standing there being queer and the whole family has no idea what to do with us. Uh, so this is an experience uh, that people report, particularly when a person dies at a relatively young age and the funeral is organized by maybe a slightly older generation. Um, so parents, grandparents, uncles and aunties, they might accept that someone is gay, but find it hard to fully embrace. Um, you know, there's a reason why every year we have pride, pride parades and pride month, uh, because just being like, mm, I guess it's okay for you to be gay is not the same as just fully embracing what it means for somebody to be fully their whole queer self. Um, and so this is a really tricky situation, both for the friends, of a queer person who is being um, negated in their identity through the funeral. And, and it's also a really tough experience for the family as well. Um, it might be difficult for parents or grandparents or uncles and aunties to fully embrace their flaming gay guy of a son or a nephew or grandson. Um, and that just, that just makes grief so difficult and um, shame is an emotion that blocks it's an emotion that like sticks in place and prevents all the other emotions from flowing and so as part of the grief process we need to feel sadness we need to feel anger we need to feel um, nostalgia there's so many feelings that we need to feel in order to process a bereavement and shame kind of blocks everything 
Um, so just a little bit more still on that topic. My mom died of cancer. Once she was diagnosed, we knew she didn't have very long to go, but obviously we didn't know how long, and it turned out to be just a few months. I came out to her ages ago, and she wasn't very supportive at the time, but by the time she died, she knew my wife, of course, she was there at our wedding, and things were okay. But I never quite could shake the feeling that she wasn't thrilled about her daughter being a lesbian. As soon as she got diagnosed, I felt like we were on the clock, and that we had to have that conversation, and it was now or never. And then she just died a few months later, and I guess it'll be never. Um, sorry, this is really emotional. <laughs> um, it's definitely okay. not as if... <laughs> Thank you. Take your time. Um, I'm giving myself permission to cry, so you all have permission yeah. to cry as well. <laughs> and it's definitely not as if my grief is unique, or as if it's all about being queer. My sister's straight, and she's grieving her mom just as much as I am. But also, this conversation we never had is just there. Um, so this is compounded from different stories uh, from friends of mine and from a couple of clients, unfortunately. Um, like I said, for a parent to say, it's fine that you're a lesbian, I love you, you're my daughter, it's okay. It's not quite the same as someone saying, I'm so glad you're a lesbian. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you came out. You're living your full authentic life. This is awesome and I'm so proud of you. I'm happy for you. Thank you for telling me, let's go to Pride together. And so accepting uh, someone as gay is a whole spectrum, much like gender is a spectrum and sexuality is a spectrum. And, and so sometimes you come out to your parents, it goes okay, but you, you feel like you're at one end of the spectrum and then death happens and it's too late to have that connection. It's too late for, you know, you, you don't you don't have a second go or a third go after someone has died um, and so obviously like I've put in, in the quote here and people are very keen to insist on that it's, like, well, it's not all about me being queer this is not about queerness it's not about it's not about queerness but it's just it's an extra added layer of of course you're grieving your mom uh, and that's really tough for anyone but there's just an extra added layer of Maybe she didn't fully know who I was, or maybe she didn't fully accept who I was. And this is something that straight people don't always experience. Okay, moving on. Relationship diversity. Uh, when my husband was in palliative care, the hospice was absolutely wonderful at accommodating both me and his other partner. I could see the nurses didn't really know what to do with us at first. But they took it in stride and never made us feel bad or wrong about being the three of us together. Um, this is a mix of different stories, but um, so I have various client, clients who are not in monogamous relationships. A few of them are in polyamorous relationships. I know a few people who identify as being an anthropal. It's not a word that is used very commonly. I think it's a word that's been weaponized a little bit uh, by people who are uh, monogamous. Um, but yeah, I guess if you're a palliative care nurse, or if you work in end of life, uh, maybe you're not used to people having two partners or three partners or having a primary partner and then a few really close loved ones. Um, and it can be hard for you to make space for everybody, but it wouldn't be authentic for a polyamorous person who is dying. It wouldn't be authentic for them to just have their primary partner there and erase everyone else that they have loved in their life, whether it was, you know, romantic relationships or big friendships. Um, big friendship is a term that is used sometimes in relationship anarchy. Um, it's, it's used um, by various people to signify friendships that are really um, just really important and a, a key pillar of your life. Um, I know myself, I don't have a romantic partner. I identify as a romantic and there's not always space for me to be there for my friends who are my big friends uh, from my big friendships. And I know that if one of them goes into hospice, I won't necessarily be invited in and I won't necessarily be able to be there for them as much as I want to be or as much as they want me to be. So I just wanted to flag this up. If you can make room, please do. Um, and also I wanted, this is a positive story because this is from something positive that happened. Um, 
if you are yourself in a polyamorous relationship and you're afraid that you won't get to be fully authentic at the end of your life or in your funeral arrangements, um, ask an advocate because a lot of the time uh, people are not trying to be bigoted or excluding they're not trying to marginalize so if we just flag up hey this is how we do things can you join us and can you let us do it that way a lot of um a lot of people will be happy to do that <clears throat> feeling seen um my partner died they were nb non-binary at a family event a few months later my cousin kindly wanted to say a few words to acknowledge my bereavement she misgendered them and got their name wrong. And I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with that. So unfortunately, this is a true story. Uh, I've changed some of the details, of course, but some of you may be familiar with Kay Tempest. Uh, they're non-binary, so they've changed their name from Kate, which was a female name, to Kay. And so this is as if Kay Tempest died and someone was like, we're very sad for the death of our beloved Catherine. And it's like, it's such a beautiful act of kindness and it's so sweet to want to acknowledge that and, you know, offer condolences. But it's also, um, it's also so terrible to get the gender wrong and the name. Um, to be honest, we actually really laughed about this because this was kind of, ridiculous enough that we could both laugh and cry about this. Um, feeling seen, this is a story told from the point of view of a parent. A few years ago, my child came out to me as non-binary. I had no problem with that. They were in their early twenties, they're exploring their identity. I thought there's lots of talk these days about gender, honestly, I didn't mind. They changed their name and that did feel a bit hurtful for me. But again, I thought it's not a big deal. Mostly I just didn't want to fight. I mean, what would be the point? They died in a road accident last year, so a very sudden death. Uh, there was this whole thing about the name we'd put on the gravestone. I already wanted their birth name to be on there because I didn't want that to be erased. But of course, we, their dad and their siblings, also wanted to respect who they were becoming. Because they died so suddenly, we never had a chance to find out what they would have wanted. Um, so yeah, I wanted to acknowledge the experience of people who are not queer themselves or who are not in gender diversity themselves. Um, it's difficult to know what's going to stay, what's going to stick, what is going to be just a phase. Uh, literally five years ago, I feel like no one identifies non-binary and now half the people I know identify as NB. Um, in five years, will we all have reverted back to traditional gender uh, binary or will everyone, will we raise our children as non-binary? I don't know. And a gravestone is a very permanent thing. And so that can be difficult to allow room for the the transient nature of self-exploration. Um, I wanted to talk about shadow loss because that is really a thing in the queer community. So I've realized I just couldn't keep in touch with my parents. It just destroyed me every time we spoke. I don't know how or why that happens exactly, but every single time it floors me and it feels like I can't move for days on end. I can't keep living like this. So I've told them I needed some space and told them not to worry. Then my grandparents started calling me insistently, telling me to call my dad. I tried to explain where I was coming from, but they really wouldn't listen. My grandpa got pretty mean. So I just hung up the phone and I think for now, I won't, I won't be calling them back for a while. Pretty much orphaned myself. Um, a lot of queer people need to cut their family off or cut themselves off from their family. That is obviously not bereavement, but there is definitely a process of grief um, because yeah, it is, it is becoming an orphan for the sake of emotional health and emotional well-being. Um, so that is definitely something to bear in mind when working with clients. Uh, clients can come up and say, I've cut off my parents, I'm estranged from my parents, this is fine, it's what I need to do, it's good for me, I'm happy to have done it. And that can definitely be true, but maybe the client is struggling to acknowledge all the grief that's happening around this decision. And I think it's for us to be aware of that and be able to welcome it in. Uh, if and when it comes up. Okay, we're going to talk about suicide. So according to a 2020 study in Britain, 82% of transgender individuals have considered killing themselves and 40% have attempted suicide. The same study shows that in a sample of almost 400 young people, 56% had attempted suicide. Sorry, that's 
queer young people. 56% had attempted suicide and 86% reported suicidality, so feelings of wanting to end their life. In 2021, just like us, did a survey of almost 3,000 young people, um, including over 1,000 who identified as LGBTQ+, and found that 68% of the queer kids had experienced suicidal thoughts, compared to 29% uh, of the straight kids. Lesbian and transgender young people were the most likely to have experienced suicidal thoughts and feelings. And I couldn't find a lot of stats about suicide in the trans community because I think the Office of National Statistics does not record when someone uh, dies by suicide, they don't record whether they're cis or trans. So we don't have access to that much data, but suicide in the trans community is an enormous issue. Um, any trans person will tell you they've experienced so much bereavement. Um, so yeah, just a couple of examples here. My friend died of an overdose and we'll never know whether it was on purpose or not. Um, this is something that people have to just live with. I'm a trans woman, I'm 25 years old. I've lost three friends to suicide and I've rescued another one. This is obviously not an actual person, but I just, I can't tell you how many clients I have who are in their early, mid twenties and have had so many bereavements already. Uh, my housemate who was trans killed herself and I'm so very, very mad at her. I can't even be sad. Um, this is something that I'm sure everyone is familiar with when, when it comes to death by suicide. Obviously, this is not limited to trans people, obviously, or queer people, but it's a complex type of grief where there's a lot of anger. Also, of course, a lot of guilt. So I'm watching my 18 year old nibbling come out as NB and I'm so proud of them. And also all I can think is, oh God, please don't kill yourself. And again, that's, that's not one person, but this is very much a sentiment. I mean, honestly, this could be me. Um, I live in constant fear of trans people um, killing themselves. Suicidality when working with trans people is extremely prominent. Um, as a counselor, if you're going to work with trans people, you need to be prepared for it. It will hit you in the face. Um, so grief and suicide, oh, that's the same side, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, just wanted to acknowledge how difficult it is to grieve a suicide again not just for queer and trans people, but it's just, it happens a lot in the queer and trans community. Grief and hate crime. The past shooting in Orlando was nearly seven years ago and I feel like it just happened last month. Um, so yeah, it was in 2016, um, a person went into a, a prominent gay nightclub in Orlando in, in Florida and shot, I think over 40 people and wounded over 50 people. Um, I genuinely feel like it just happened. I couldn't believe when I looked it up, I couldn't believe it was 2016. And then this is a direct quote from a client of mine who walked into my office, bereft, looked at me and said, you heard about Brianna, right? I had not heard about Brianna. Uh, Brianna is a young trans girl who was murdered um, in February, um, at the start of February by two, uh, two other kids. She was 16, I think the kids who murdered her were 15. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you've all heard about it by now. It was very much in the news. Um, the newspapers started by misgendering her. They uh, revealed her dead name and then there was a whole backlash about trying to get her um, gendered correctly and making sure that her name was being recognized. So I've included a few photos here that are not showing up. Oh, there they are. Um, hate crime, again, is not specific to the queer community. Obviously, um, people of color experience a lot of hate crime, uh, for sure. But I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that this is something that straight, cis, white people um, just don't experience as much as queer people. Um, and so there's a real pain there. I think it's just about being prepared, like, if you're raising a queer kid, uh, you may need to know that a shooting in Florida or the death of a girl in Cheshire that they've never met can affect them. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, disenfranchised grief. I feel like such an idiot. I'm a grown adult crying over the death of some teenage girl I've never met. 
some girl in Saudi Arabia killed herself because she was forced to detransition again. That's something that happened uh, quite recently, just a couple of months ago. And somehow I'm crying real tears about my Instagram. Like she was my childhood best friend. Seriously, what's wrong with me? I found out that my ex's flatmate from back then killed herself and I couldn't get out of bed for three days. We hung out for maybe six months. I haven't spoken to her in years. What even is this? Um, so when someone from the community uh, kills, them, de kills themselves or is killed, um, th that's a disenfranchised version of grief. It's hard to be like, oh yeah, I am definitely grieving for Brianna. I'm just sad that Brianna got killed. Um, a lot of people feel like they are not legitimate, they're not valid in their feelings and experience, but community bereavement is a thing. Humans are small group primates. We are affected when one of our own is killed or dies a traumatic death. One of our own can mean a lot of things. Um, so even though the LGBT community doesn't always feel like a community and we're certainly not a monolith and it's not like we're all pals, uh, when someone gets, some, someone gets killed for being gay or trans, it does feel like it's one of our own who's been attacked. And you always wonder, could that happen to me or my kid? Um, yeah, I just don't know how to put that more clearly. We care about when something happens to people that we know or places that we know and love. Um, I It just felt like I needed something to cry about. So that's, that's kind of more about projected grief. Um, I witness so much rejection, so much discrimination, so much hate, and I can see how that all destroys people. Um, but obviously 99% of the time, no one dies. So you just do your best to get on with it and you can't grieve every microaggression and you can't grieve systemic marginalization. Being able to just be sad, fully crying with a bunch of other queers in George Square, I guess that was really cathartic and I didn't know how much I needed it. Um, so I've put that together, I've pieced that together from different testimonies from different people. So after the death of Brianna, there was a vigil in George Square and yeah, there was about a thousand of us, you know, super queer people you know there were people wearing like uh incredible costumes and full makeup and there were some beautiful speeches some people read some absolutely gorgeous poems that they had clearly written themselves um and yeah it's good to have a place where you can cry about all the things that you can't cry about on the day to day um nobody has time to have a breakdown every time something homophobic or transphobic happens because it happens all the time but a death is something that you can just be like, yeah, I'm going to gather up my community and I'm going to go be sad with my community. Um, suicide and hate crime also causes anxiety. Um, so again, I've written that from the point of view of a parent. I live in constant fear of something happening to my daughter in school or online. You hear all about the cyberbullying. I have no idea what happens on TikTok. It's normal for teenagers to do things that parents don't approve of. And it's normal that she doesn't tell me everything. I know that. She should be able to just be a normal kid without her mom breathing down her neck about her every social interaction. But I can't help but think that for other kids, it's not life or death. Um, so this is something that parents and family of queer kids report quite commonly. Um, everyone is aware of the, the statistics on hate crime and bullying and harassment in school, and no one really knows what to do about it. Uh, and so when, when a trans kid dies, whether it's suicide or hate crime, um, everyone suddenly feels like, oh no, this could have been my own. I wanted to talk about projected grief. Um, I think the story I've written is actually more about trauma, actually. So I live with HIV. It's all fine. I go for checkups, but at this point, it's pretty much undetectable. I take antivirals and it's perfectly manageable. It doesn't affect my life at all. I did not watch It's a Sin, and I tend to stay away from stories about the AIDS epidemic. They always make my spine go cold. It feels like grieving for the ghost of some alternative version of myself. It's a bit too close to home. Um, there's not that many people nowadays living with HIV, uh, but there's a few and quite a lot of them are gay men. Um, and even if it's people who haven't lived through the AIDS epidemic, um, there's inherited trauma within the community, which again, I feel like, as a counselor, it's just so easy to not know that or not think about that. Um, whenever a gay person, if I work with a gay man who's 40 or older than that, I'm not thinking about the AIDS epidemic from the 80s. Um, 
I was a little kid when it happened. I didn't know it was queer. It just, it feels very separated. But then TV shows like It's a Sin, which came out in 2020, I think, um, they do bring it up for us and make it more alive. Um, and I think that was a good opportunity. I wanted to mention that show basically. <laughs> and I wanted to mention the community trauma of, because I'm talking about very recent deaths, I also want to talk about the AIDS epidemic, even though it was a very long time ago. So I'm going to talk about grief and politics, and I'm almost out of time. Sometimes it's hard to find the line between your own personal bereavement and your own feelings around grief and the absolute outrage of the political, the political situation. Yet another trans person dies and you're sad because it's a friend, it's a friend of a friend or an old colleague or someone you've dated for a bit. And it's the end of your life, it's a tragedy. But also it feels like yet another trans person died. At what point do we start holding people accountable for the terrible environment we're providing for trans people and trans kids? When is it appropriate to move from grief to political action? Um, at the vigil for Brianna, there was a lot of sadness, of course, but there was so much anger. People were just screaming. There was just a couple of people screaming, just, I'm so angry. Um, angry at the media, angry. It was, it was just around the time that the Scottish government passed the, the gender recognition bill and Westminster pushed back on it. And it just did not, it just did not feel like a coincidence. And it's difficult because we want to acknowledge the death of this young person. Her family lost their daughter. You know, it's not about a political fight, but the amount of trans people who kill themselves, um, it's just too much to be a coincidence. And it, it, it does feel like it's a direct result of the environment we created for trans people. Um, so I just wanted to, again, going back to the AIDS uh, epidemic, Larry Kramer founded ACT UP in 1987, six years into the AIDS epidemic. He made a big speech and a sentence that really, you know, st um, sticks out. Unless we fight for our lives, we shall die. ACT UP used die-ins for many years as a tactic for impactful protest, followed by staged public funerals. Uh, 1992, in a demonstration known as Ashes Action, activists gathered in Washington, D.C., um, some carrying the ashes and bone chips of loved ones who had died of AIDS to disperse over the White House lawn. Before ACT UP, in February of 87, Cleve Jones created the first panel of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. Um, it's a really beautiful piece of art. If you're not familiar, I re really recommend checking it out. When the quilt was first displayed at the end of 87, it had 1,920 names of people who died of AIDS, and then it grew to include over 10,000. Um, so I guess it just felt important for me to end on this because there's all, all the feedings around bereavement, Bereavement is a very intimate experience. Grief is a very intimate, it's a very personal process. But when we talk about grief in the queer community and in the trans community, it feels like it's not just a personal sadness and a personal loss. It also feels like as a society, maybe we need to reflect um, on who dies and why and why we let them die. So I've just got a couple of slides of resources. Um, how to plan your end of life. I saw a statistic and I never was able to find it again. So maybe I made it up, but I, I think I saw something that said that uh, gay men and lesbians tend to not plan their end of lives. They're less likely to have a will. Um, trans people do not plan the end of their life unless they are planning their suicide. Uh, that's outrageous and awful to say, but it is true. Um, there's not a lot of older trans people. Um, and so, yeah, here's a list of resources, like all of them are links, but actually I don't know if that's very useful if you can't access the slide. Um, but there's stuff from Mary Curie, from the NHS from Sue Ryder, from Cruz, definitely, how to support LGBTQ plus people through grief, how to plan a queer funeral, um, how to be your full authentic self, um, celebrating the life of a loved one or planning your own end of life. And then resources around mental health, because again, we've talked a lot about suicide and hate crime. Um, and so I've just put in a few links to various mental health support 